we are now going to have a panel discussion about some of these privacy developments and how to think about it. I uh, just wanted to express, I'm Mihir Shrasaga from uh, Princeton's Center for Information Technology Policy. It's a center between our policy school and an engineering school that works to understand and improve the relationship between digital technology and society. I'm joined by an all-star panel here of people who are deeply involved with thinking about privacy issues um, from various different perspectives. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly. You can look uh, their bios up on the web so that we can get into the heart of the discussion. Uh, we have Margot Kaminsky, who's a professor of law here and a leading scholar of privacy and AI. Uh, next to her, we have Stevie DeGroff, who's from the Colorado Attorney General's office, uh, who's deeply involved in crafting the leading privacy regulations that Colorado developed. Uh, and then Chandler Crenshaw from the Virginia AG's office, who's responsible for managing and enforcing Virginia's privacy laws. And then we're fortunate to have two practitioners join us, uh, Katie Kramer from Perkins Coie, um, who counsels technology companies on privacy regulation, and uh, Andrea Majeski from uh, Greenberg Trorig, uh, who's also a proud alum of, of this wonderful institution. Um, so, and, and she works uh, on developing privacy programs for clients uh, of all sizes uh, across a range of sectors. So uh, we've, we've got a great set of people um, and some very interesting questions, which I think maybe we can start with Margot to give us a stage set and give us a 50,000 foot overview of what's, the pri what's going on in the privacy landscape, where do all these states who are doing, the 19 states who are doing all this work, how do they fit into this broader privacy landscape? How should we be thinking about this? So that could take three hours. Um, I'm going to try to do the mm, under three minutes version of it. So um, back in 2018, Europe's general data protection regulation went into effect. That is a huge, huge moment for data privacy law around the world. Europe had had data privacy law, but it was not completely harmonized, nor did it have the enforcement mechanisms that the GDPR had nor did the existing privacy law explicitly reach out to companies transatlantically in the way that the GDPR did. What this did was, as a matter of political economy, uh, lower resistance by the biggest corporate actors affected by data privacy, who already now had to comply with European data privacy law. That means that a lot of these actors who had been sort of visibly uh, against movements to regulate suddenly became really afraid of uh, there being fraction in, fra uh, uh, fractioning in the harmonization landscape. So they went from thinking, gosh, we really need to avoid regulation to, gosh, we really need to make sure that the regulation that's popping up everywhere isn't all so different. And we need to make sure that it's largely going to contain stuff we already have to do under Europe's GDPR. Does this mean that US states started enacting European style data privacy? Absolutely not. Um, I was saying earlier on a panel that, you know, Europe's law, if you count all the stuff that goes with it, that's interpretation is hundreds and hundreds of pages. And the original uh, California Privacy Act was probably 23 pages. So you can't possibly take something that's hundreds of pages and make something that's 23 pages equivalent to it. Uh, you can ask ChatGPT. Um, and so some of the backbone of Europe's law became the backbone for US laws with some really important variations between states. So the first version of the CCPA, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, was largely an older school data privacy law that focused on individual rights and transparency. It was a know your rights law uh, and know where your data is law that focused on empowering individuals to exercise some form of individual choice, albeit articulated in data privacy terms. That is not the law that ended up in lots of other states, including Colorado. Instead, what happened, and I'm happy to uh, debate people on this, is that there was another law that was proposed but never enacted in Washington state, which is the home to Microsoft. And that law um, was significantly more GDPR-like in that it proposed a split, uh, or really a parallel tracks of individual privacy rights coupled with significant corporate compliance. For a number of reasons, uh, in large part opposition by a number of civil society organizations who found that law not to be adequately protective of consumers, that law was never enacted in Washington state. 
but became the basis for laws enacted in states around the country. I see some of the attorney generals agreeing with me. <laughs> that means I'm definitely right. So, um, so there are variations on this, right? The Washington Act model, um, there are some versions of it that are less consumer protective, and there are some versions of it that are more consumer protective. When California went back and revised its law, it veered more towards that model, though not entirely. Um, and it, unlike any other state, created its own data privacy agency. So you have this basic backdrop of individual rights and corporate compliance with a number of different really important differences in the details. I'll just highlight one of them. Um, data minimization, which is a core principle of data privacy law from the European Un Union, which says don't collect all the data without knowing why you're collecting the data and doing it for a legitimate purpose. That's in some of these state laws. It's not in other state laws. It's defined differently in some state laws than it is from other laws, and there's other loopholes. Um, so, so you have similar backbones, difference, devils in the details. Um, and I think that we're now starting to see uh, are some really interesting developments on the state data privacy law level of additional innovations that are maybe US specific. So I'll just end with this. Um, I think it's really interesting that a lot of state states have amended their definition of personal information um, from what's something that almost entirely tracked Europe's GDPR to considerations about uh, discrimination and lack of equity, for example, by adding into personal information immigration status um, or adding into personal information um, information about uh, reproductive health. So we, are, we have our own version. It's not just Europe. It's varying across different states. We now have 19 enthusiastic states that have enacted it. And I haven't said a word about AI law yet. That's all. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, so Stevie, can you give us an overview then of how Colorado fits into this picture? Yeah. My, I feel like I'm shorter than everyone here. I need to scoot the mic forward. Um, happy to. Um, so, uh, and I guess I have to always give the precursor that what I express today are my views, not necessarily that of my office. So, um, so we in Colorado, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, were, and as uh, A.G. Weiser just mentioned, we're the third state to pass comprehensive privacy legislation. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, I have Chandler right here, who's number two. Yeah, we number Stacey, we've got some California That's here, good. number one. So, I, you know, I, I, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Um, and but no uh, one's counting. Right? Yeah, it's fine. No one's counting. Not paying attention at all. Um, so uh, with our law, it went into effect um, in July of last year. And um, as you heard, worked really closely with the team, Jill Subcheck here, who none of this would be possible without, to draft regulations um, as well. And I think part of what's interesting about both California and Colorado, and now a few states, is it's not just a law. We do have rulemaking authority. And so issuing regulations in addition to the law to help clarify some of the ambiguities, to help point out where things actually are interoperable with other laws or international law, um, to make sure that terms that we're using that maybe aren't used elsewhere or clearly defined um, to hopefully help round out our law, understanding that there's all the movement that Margo has been talking about. Um, also, uh, the law includes a, um, a requirement that consumers can use a universal opt-out mechanism um, to exercise their right to opt out of the sale of their personal data or the use of their personal data for targeted advertising. Um, this is, again, something that I think Colorado learned watching what happened in California, and now you're seeing more and more states go down this path as well to make some of these consumer rights really easy to enact. Um, we issued regulations alongside the universal opt-out mechanism, uh, along with a list of opt-out mechanisms that we recognize meet our regulations. Those came out at the end of last year, and you can find the list online right now at coag.gov slash uoom or oom, as we keep pushing <laughs> on everyone to use it. No, it's, that just isn't going to happen. Um, so, uh, and then more recently, some of you may have seen with your eagle eyes that yesterday, um, our office posted a draft of regulations related to opinion letters and interpretive guidance. Um, and this is, again, something that was included in the law um, as to if, if our office wanted to issue regulations about it, which we did, we had to do it by a certain date. So we're doing that right now. Um, and so those are now posted. And I think one of the common themes, and this was also mentioned in, in the AG's speech, is how important it is for our office to engage with the public in making these roles. Um, I think this is in part a recognition that we've got brilliant partners in other states that are thinking about these things. And so we love to hear from them during the rulemaking. We want to hear from businesses that are having to comply across different states. We want to hear from consumers that are having to deal with how does this impact my life. Um, and so throughout, even though the law 
quote unquote, static. It's been around, um, you know, for several years now. The regulations are really our opportunity to stay current with what's happening in other states and other countries related to data privacy. Um, and as the technology evolves, make sure that our regulations keep our law current. Great, thank you. Uh, and at a state conference, surprising, no one's yet said the laboratories of democracy, but yeah. there are various different models of approaching data privacy. And Chandler, what's your perspective from the second state to have adopted privacy regulation? <laughs> Yes, we're, we're, we are the second state in Virginia to um, uh, implement our Consumer Data Protection Act. Um, once again, thank you for inviting us me here today. Um, I, and I, also, as Stevie said, similarly, um, I don't speak on behalf of my office. I'm here in my you know, capacity to speak about what I do is enforcing the law. So we, um, we thought initially early on when this law went into effect that it would be a good idea to do like a public awareness campaign for it because it's... People want uh, to, you know, have their data rights protected. So, and the law provides for that opportunity for them. So we um, created this uh, FAQ section on our website as soon as the law went into effect that showed consumers what their rights are and what they can do to um, uh, file a complaint with a controller under the law and what they can do to file a complaint with our office under the law so they think the controller is not adhering to the law. Um, we released a press release that went all the way uh, across the state. And so uh, what we saw from that is that people did submit complaints to our office. Um, and I can't get into any, you know, uh, you know investigations or um, ongoing uh, matters. But, I mean, we, we have received complaints. Um, we are going through the process of, um, uh, you know, investigating targets and uh, seeing if they are adhering to the law. Uh, we have created a, a consumer privacy unit in the consumer protection section of Virginia that focuses on consumer data protection uh, laws, um, including other privacy laws. Like Virginia recently passed a Virginia genetic data privacy law, um, which is specific for genetic testing. Um, and we are actively enforcing that law as well. Um, so we're doing things in Virginia. We also will touch base on it a little later. We are in, uh, involved in uh, multi states with several other um, states that have enacted their own privacy laws as well. Um, and so uh, we are vigorously enforcing the Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act. It's been in effect since January 1st, 2023. Um, and we just see it as also a, another tool in the a toolkit for, uh, you know, consumer protection laws. I mean, we've had a consumer protection law in Virginia for decades and that focuses on deceptive conduct. And this is just another tool that we have that um, if consumers think that their data is, um, if they want to have their data you know, deleted or, or, or access to it, they have a right in Virginia. And so that's where we, our office comes into play. And um, we are um, continuing to enforce it as the second state in the uh, country to do it. <laughs> Great. Um, Katie, your, your counseling clients, um, it's, you know, privacy laws, 19 different states can be a full employment act. Um, but what are some common themes that when you're trying to give practical guidance to clients about where the states are, what are some common themes that you're seeing, how states are implementing their privacy laws? Yeah, I think one of the, the important virtues of these different 19 laws is that they do have a lot in common, both at a principles level and at even a textual level. Um, and so that does make it easier to kind of get buy-in from, from businesses and for businesses, legal, legal folks within a business to get buy-in across their organization. I think one piece of the history, Margot talked a little bit about the history from across the Atlantic, but another important point is that a lot of the state laws amplify and codify principles the FTC had espoused for decades. And we now have more kind of meat on the bone to, to build on those through these state laws. Um, I think maybe I'll give two examples from among the suite of 19 laws that are really important in every state. Um, one is their really deep focus on advertising, particularly in the cross contextual sense of that word, meaning using data collected about you on, in your activity on site A to inform the ad that you're shown on site B. Um, each of the laws, there's a little bit of variance in terminology, but each of them essentially provide consumers now an opt out for that practice. So for any company, either a company that makes money by publishing ads kind of exists in the background as a technology intermediary or is, you know, 
needing to advertise their products on other sites, they all need to think about how that opt out applies to them. Um, I think another, you know, kind of key area of commonality where the effort you undertake in Colorado pays dividends across all the rest of the states is in sensitive data, right? And there's a lot of overlap in how the states have, have defined that term. And in a lot of ways, it kind of reflects things that consumers already felt inherently should merit more protection, right? Like how a company is using data about your health condition or your race or your sexual orientation. Um, and so most states now require an opt-in consent for most uses of that data or other states impose um, like an opt-out standard. And so I think, you know, one of the things is like, we kind of remind our clients a lot is your efforts are not wasted here. Usually an effort you're undertaking in one place will help you across all 19 states. And indeed many of them are just extending those protections across the country because operationally, operationalizing a single standard is much easier. Great, thank you. Andrea, I've got the harder question for you. Everyone's been getting softballs here, but this is slightly harder, um, which is, you know, where do you see your clients struggle with different regulatory regimes and what guidance are you trying to provide them in those contexts? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what has in large part been said by both Margaret, Margot and Catherine, in that although the states are um, very consistent in some ways, there are these small nuances that create enough of a difference that companies have to be aware of them. And when you're talking about 19 different laws, each of which are X amount of pages long, like you're asking a lot of companies to understand and digest and be able to parse those differences. But, you know, Margot, you mentioned loopholes. Um, that arise from these nuances. But when you are a company that's working in 50 different states, you're ultimately complying with the highest standard. And so those loopholes sort of disappear in many ways. But where I do see businesses struggling, even with that concept, is often in the targeted advertising sense. And this is really California versus everywhere else, because California has a special mm, sort of carve out for if you consent to sharing with certain people, you no longer have that right to opt out of targeted advertising. And so we see these very complex structures um, being contemplated by businesses who are trying to maximize the profits and bottom lines that they're gaining from advertising and marketing, because that's a big deal, right? Um, another distinction that I often see that I find very fascinating and is maybe not as relevant to all businesses is the intra-company sharing of data, right? Um, there are some differences in the definitions of affiliates and sales that lead to these weird inadvertent sales of data when you're sharing amongst your similarly branded companies, especially in like a franchise model or something like that. And so having the conversation about what do you as a company need to do to manage you know, the privacy regulation in conjunction with your corporate structure is um, something that companies are having to wrestle with a little bit. Great, thank you. Yeah, Stevie, you know, one, one of the goals is to lev get a level playing field and get companies to innovate um, with a clear set of privacy guidelines. So what has been your experience in the comment regulatory process of how to go about doing that in Colorado? Yeah, I feel like I got lucky because my AG spoke, so I can kind of get off easy on some of these because he spoke to this, um, you know, and he mentioned to this group already the importance of thinking about our regulations and our law from a principled standpoint um, and not being as prescriptive. And I think that's important because different businesses, as, um, as my private practice colleagues have said, may think of different ways to implement some of these. Um, and there's so many different business models that we can't possibly have imagined all of them out with a prescriptive model. Um, so making sure that, that the principles are there and they're clear, I think is really critical there. I, you know, we've also already talked about the importance of deep stakeholder involvement in our rulemaking process um, and ensuring that we're thoughtful um, in crafting regulations so that they actually work. One of the things that Katie and I were talking about before the panel was no consumers get the benefit of anyone's privacy laws if a business can't actually implement them. Um, and so that's something that we have to keep in mind while we're protecting consumers. 
Um, and the last thing I'll just touch on that we haven't really talked about today is the role of enforcement in there. Um, and, you know, the right to cure came up. And, and I think more broadly speaking, as we approach enforcement, um, oftentimes, especially early in the stage of some of these laws, enforcement can be an opportunity to educate businesses and work with them to bring them to bring them into compliance. Um, I would say nine times out of 10, not always, but more often than not, when we reach out to a business, they do want to comply and they're honestly trying. That's a very different situation than a business who's like willfully flouting the law, you know, has, has kind of saw that there is an opportunity to make extra money if they didn't follow the law. Um, and I think in that instance, really strong enforcement is also important because it sends a message to the market that these are the kinds of things that harm consumers and are really, really important to us that, that, that can't continue. Um, and that maybe is the kind of innovation that we don't want to see, yeah. I'll say. Yeah. And Chandler, can you speak to sort of enforcement and violations and, and you know, how, how does Virginia approach that in coordinating with, with the other states and, and the federal government? Sure. So with the, our, our Consumer Data Protection Act, it's, it's similar to how we do other kind of multi-state actions with um, other consumer protection laws that we have. I mean, we, uh, if, if sometimes we'll just have conversations with our AG colleagues in other states, um, sometimes we'll have uh, 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 meetings through uh, the National Attorney General Association that we uh, are, are discussing ideas and um, potential investigations. So it's, it's, it's similar in the sense that from, uh, from originally with consumer protection actions that we just have a new tool here in, in our toolkit to, to do for investigations. So um, with collaboration, like we are currently working with other states and multi-states on issues that relate specifically to consumer data protection laws. So it's a way for states to kind of come together. And even though we, we don't have like a national standard, we have, um, we have this ability to come together and and, um, and and to do enforcement actions. And Andrea, from from the business side, when you're watching these multi-state coordinations, uh, how's that benefited, uh, or has that, I guess, benefited your clients? What has been your experience? It's a tricky, it's a tricky question from a practitioner standpoint because we don't have the same level of insight as the AG's offices or you know the government regulators in general. I, I uh, frankly, um, the business community doesn't usually see these coordinated efforts, right? So we as practitioners know that there are behind the scenes enforcement actions or investigations that are happening, but most of those aren't public. And you don't really see multi-state enforcement actions yet. And I'm sure that that will change as the laws continue to progress. Um, but in a similar manner, you're not seeing any public announcements of states getting together and being like, hey, how should we draft these laws, right? Like you can kind of read it when you read through the laws, you're like, oh, okay, these are pretty consistent. But again, there are enough nuances that it's not fully harmonized. And so the question is hard because we don't really see it. But I'm, I'm happy to see that <laughs> stuff like this is happening, which I didn't know about until right now. Um, <laughs> you know, where the AG's offices are getting together and they're saying, all right, how do we do this better? So there's one set of people that maybe the AG offices are not spending as much time with the, the international colleagues. Um, and Margot, what are your thoughts on, on how AG offices should approach that question? Oh, that's hard. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about yet, but I think is evident even from this panel, is that there's shockingly bipartisan consensus around data privacy in the United States. Um, there's not necessarily bipartisan consensus on aligning with Europe. Um, so it's a tricky question. You know, on the one hand, Europe has longstanding institutions with a great deal of regulatory expertise. They have data protection authorities. They have the European Data Protection Board, formerly the Article 29 Working Party. If you don't know what any of this means, that's okay. Um, and uh, they also have courts um, namely the European Court of Justice that have produced case law that is of enormous important normative weight behind a lot of the really big terms in European data privacy law. So what we don't really know is the extent to which a word in a piece of US legislation is actually the same thing as a word in a piece of European regulation. Um, and as to whether it's desirable for those two things to mean the same thing, I think you'd get very different answers, uh, maybe, 
um, from different states with different political backgrounds. Um, Katie, just to switch gears just a little bit, um, but one area that states are, are very coordinated on and the federal government too is protecting children uh, privacy online. Um, and do you, from your practitioner's point of view, are you seeing sufficient guidance from regulators on how responsible companies should navigate this space or what's missing that maybe they should be providing? Yeah, great question. Um, definitely not. <laughs> um, I would say actually as to users under 13, probably yes, right? Because there we have a federal law that has been in place for many years, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act called COPPA and actively enforced by the FTC. So yes, I think there we have kind of decades of, of kind of guidance and expectation and enforcement to, to build from. I think as any parent of teens will tell me, teens are more complicated than young kids in a lot of ways. And I think, um, I think moving into that space as we're seeing lots of states experiment with has created a lot of like really interesting intellectually and policy challenges, right? So I think these many new laws vary on a, a host of different dimensions. Um, they are kind of vary among like what age of the child should we be protecting? Who should be tasked with protecting that child? Is it about empowering the teen with more information and choices? Is it about giving the parent more control over the teen? Is it about putting more responsibility on the company to evaluate their products in uh, along the lines of different kind of interests like the best interest of the child or preventing significant harms? Um, they vary on the, the nature of products that, that merit this regulation. Is it a company that just looks more like a traditional social media company or is it kind of really any online product or service? Um, and then you layer on top of that all these different kind of types of laws, types of people or types of activities we're trying to protect. You layer on top of that a, a really complex um, litigation landscape where you have both courts and policymakers trying to figure out where these kind of concepts bump up against the First Amendment and other kind of legal principles in, in our country. And you're left with a, a very kind of uncertain um, scheme for, for which a company can operate. I think I did want to say, though, I think there are a couple things that are pretty, pretty uniform or kind of marching towards uniform on this point. I think one, circling back to my point about advertising, moving towards a kind of no targeted advertising to people under 18 as a kind of principle, I think we're seeing increasing kind of uniformity towards that point. And second, I, I think one of the things that we see in all of the, most of the 19 laws and many of these kind of kids or teen specific laws is a notion of a data protection impact assessment or some similar term, which is really the company taking a step back and doing a really careful analysis of what personal data they're collecting, the justification for that purposes, and kind of what safeguards they can put in place, right? So balancing the benefits and harms and safeguards. And, and I think you will continue to see that sort of kind of privacy focused um, assessment framework continue. And I do want to I do want to jump in and yeah. comment on something you said, which was everything is so uncertain right now that like thinking about how you know, um, Phil's top topic is really focused on you know how can we progress innovation and make sure that products are still being made because of how uncertain the landscape is with you know any product that impacts kids under the age of eighteen. I do worry that we're seeing less innovation in that sector because we just don't know how you know which way the regulation is going to go and how enforcement is going to play out if you want more certainty maybe they should stop filing first amendment lawsuits <laughs> <laughs> i can say that i'm the academic that's right um, and, and, i mean you know just just today um and this is a question you've probably not seen this if you have but instagram has announced some new rules um around protecting uh, kids who are teenagers. So now, for example, you know, they're, they're going to, if, if you have a teenage account, it's going to be private by default. Uh, and also you won't be pinged between 10 and seven in, in the, uh, in the day. So you're seeing some companies take some steps and I guess, Andrew, from, from your perspective, sort of what, what have been the kinds of actions that have prompted companies to take those kinds of steps and how, why do you think, 
um, companies like Instagram are taking these kinds of actions? I mean, without being able to look inside the very complex brain of Instagram and all co companies associated <laughs> right, with that. I didn't that. want to be just about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I would assume that, you know, self-regulation is, is, is quite common when you see instability in, you know, external regulation, right? In order to protect yourself against potentials, you just take a higher standard and you say, hey, I'm doing this better than everyone else. I should not be the target. Like, look at me, let's build regulations or let's build rules based on what I'm doing and then go from there and hopefully I've got it right. I would assume that that's some of their thinking. It's almost like a perspective protection, um, but it also could honestly just be like a PR play, right? Like, hey, I'm Instagram and I swear I care about your kids. <laughs> Katie, uh more broadly, sort of, there, there are all these pain points that both of you have identified for companies struggling with um, how to go about developing uh, forward-looking policies. Um, you know, short of a comprehensive federal privacy law, which we heard from the Attorney General, is highly unlikely um, for the time being. What's what's the better? What are ways that we can come up with better guidance uh, for for clients to for your clients to to develop responsible policies? Yeah, I, I'm actually going to borrow from the attorney general because I think what's what's really worked in terms of communicating among businesses is speaking at a principles level, right? Like I think that North Star is is really the way you you kind of cut through the jargon or the the many pages or the complexity of 19 different laws. And I think, you know, among some of my clients, they've had a lot of success doing kind of like principles-based training. And one part of that is like, what is personal data in the year 2024? It is not just your email address, right? So like, I think even getting to that level of, of sensitizing people to the issues then has led to like a lot more interest and kind of outreach from the business folks to the legal folks within the companies I work with. And those types of conversations really can get you to the place where you're building a product with, with privacy in mind, or you're making sure that you're launching it with the right notices and choices. Um, I think another another model that we've seen success in kind of client sensitizing these issues is really like aligning the principles in these laws with their brand values. So like, even if you're not gonna use privacy legal words, like caring about your customers means caring about their data or um, having a principle of like not being creepy means not doing really <laughs> creepy things with their data, right? So I think thinking about ways that you can kind of build on values that your the company already holds is another like good education tool. Yeah, and Steve, for you, you know, with AG offices are wonderful, but of course they have limited resources. Um, how do you go about prioritizing areas for an AG office to take action? I mean, we have limited resources. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's never, it's, yeah. <laughs> As I was thinking when you said that, you know, the less alignment with Europe, I was like, if someone wants to fly me to Paris, I'm happy to go meet with the IPO, <laughs> but, you know. I don't think the state center. I don't think so. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, just tossing it out there. Um, so, I mean, I think that at core, and, and Chandler's mentioned this, data privacy, I think for all of our states, sits within consumer protection. And so the bottom line for us is how can we best protect consumers? And what are the actions that we can take when we have limited resources to have the biggest impact when we're protecting consumers? Um, so part of that for our state looks at the complaints that come through. Um, the team built an amazing complaint portal. Um, Stop Fraud Colorado has existed long before we had a data privacy law, but now you can use that to file specific complaints related to data privacy and data security. And we review Jill and I, every single one of the complaints, <laughs> we read them all when they come through and we look for themes. What are the things that Coloradans especially are complaining about? Um, what's harm, like where, where's the harm coming for them to help us prioritize what we're thinking about? Um, we meet regularly with our colleagues in other states and start to think about are there common things that we're seeing across the nation? Um, and then can we collectively act to reduce that harm to consumers? Um, one of the other big things that I'll mention that we think about in Colorado is what are the areas of our law that may be a little unique or a little stronger um, where we can act and because of our action, we're raising the bar, um, at least for Coloradans, but, um, you know, as Katie and Andrea have mentioned, oftentimes companies will kind of take the highest um, request, of the, the, the highest standard and implement it nationally. So that's a way for us to kind of push 
the national standard forward and protect more consumers. Um, so that looks like we are one of the states that has opt-in for sensitive data. And I think sensitive data is also an area where you really start to see really powerful and potentially incredibly harmful um, outcomes for consumers when that sensitive data is misused. So focusing on the misuse of sensitive data, the lack of protection for sensitive data, or the over collection of sensitive data, those are kind of all areas where that kind of prioritization is really impactful for our office. Um, also thinking about um, you know, we talked about children's data. Um, you know, our legislature did amend our law to, to include children. So these are kind of the areas where we can look and say, this will have a really strong positive impact on protecting consumers. And that's where we want to spend the most of our time. Um, and then there's other areas or maybe it's education campaign um, with our communications team where we want to get the word out to empower consumers. Um, and that's going to have the biggest impact for us as opposed to an individual enforcement action. Great. And Charlie, you get you get the hard one on this one, right? Which is the flip side of this, and where where, where are some places where it's challenging to coordinate across states, and um, where what has been your experience with that? Well, with with you know with coordinating across states, it's um, I mean it's the the communication is easy. We're able to you know uh, reach out to our colleagues in other states and um, discuss these and matters and look for common threads, as Stevie said, and um, and. Well, that typically could lead to uh, an investigation, but I mean, there are growing pains with these new laws coming out that there's several, I mean, these laws are different, they're unique. We don't have one federal standard. Um, and so, I mean, the laws range in, you know, scope, they range in remedies, exemptions. Uh, some states have cure periods, some don't. So um, that, that can be a, you know, challenge when it comes to investigating and uh, uh, seeing like, how we can take investigations, but uh, I've, I've kind of touched upon this already. It's similar. I mean, most states have, uh, every state has a Consumer Protection Act. And so, uh, and we have multi-state investigations where um, the laws vary in the states. Like in Virginia, we don't, many states have unfair and deceptive conduct. We don't have unfair, uh, unfairness in our, in our act. So, but yet we do work on multi-states that have, states that have statutes like that. So even though we do have differences in state laws, we can still kind of come together and do investigations. Yeah, yeah when I was in the New York AG's office, we also didn't have unfairness, but we often worked with, with other states. Um, Margo, switching gears a little bit back, I think to another topic you could go on for a while on, um, which is there's been a variety of First Amendment challenges to state privacy regulations. Some have met with success, uh, some haven't. Um, what is your sense of, you know, is it too early to, to see if there are any trends in how courts are looking at the First Amendment challenges or, or are there trends that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, invite a law professor to speak and I really can go on for a while. I'm going to try to be really brief. Um, so I think we saw there were a wave of privacy challenges that met with very little success um, for a variety of reasons. And then there have been a wave of recent challenges that have met with more success that should be really terrifying to everybody working in the data privacy space. The prior challenges that did not meet with success included things like um, regulated internet service providers in Maine saying you can't write a law that imposes privacy requirements on internet service providers because that's treating us unfairly uh, as speakers different from other kinds of speakers. And that lawsuit went kind of nowhere. Another example are the laws that push back against enactment of non-consensual pornography laws, um, sorry, suits that push back against the enactment of non-consensual pornography laws, um, namely the sharing of intimate imagery um, without consent. And those, in those lawsuits in at least two different jurisdictions, we see courts actually wrestling with the idea that like, yeah, the First Amendment's important, but actually privacy is really important too. And these are really easily observable, I would call them old school privacy harms, right? There's shame involved, there's monetary damages, there's you know, um, basically excommunication from communities. Uh, and so courts are able a little bit more easily to say, okay, this gets weighed against free speech interests and sometimes loses. The more recent cases have been targeted at like the, you heard the, the acronym DPIA used earlier, um, the regulatory tools data protection laws. So that includes things like mandatory disclosures. It includes things like design mandates, like don't use dark patterns, um, and includes things like even 
um, I think shockingly, the data protection or data privacy impact assessment, which is really a regulatory process by which these high level principles that we're all advocating um, get concretized in individual companies when they figure out like what are the actual risks of our actual product and how do we mitigate those actual risks. The Ninth Circuit, uh, after a terrible district court opinion, um, made a slightly less terrible but still terrible uh, Court of Appeals opinion in a case on um, uh, California's Age Appropriate Design Code Act, which is their children's privacy law, said that requiring companies to disclose data protection impact assessments to the state regulators was a violation of their First Amendment rights because it was compelled speech. Um, that, in my view, I, I could go in for a very long time into why I think that's bonkers, but that's really bad for all regulators across all kinds of states. So the game here is to try to help courts gently, um, sometimes not so gently, recalibrate what they see as First Amendment problems in the first instance, remind them that like a healthy regulatory state not only is good for consumers, but is actually good for speech in general, because if we don't trust these companies, we're not gonna use their products. Um, and uh, in general, maybe make these lower courts aware that the landscape at the Supreme Court in terms of skepticism of large corporate actors in this space may have shifted even as recently as this last summer. Great. Uh, so audience, you can start preparing or thinking of, of questions. You're gonna have two more questions, but the audience, uh, if, if there are questions, you can start thinking about what questions you might ask. Um, so I have a question for the panel and you can jump in where you want on consumer education, right? We've, we've heard a lot about the importance of consumer education. A lot depends on how well it's done. Um, I mean, one astonishing fact, right? From Apple changing its iOS to making it do not track, people took it up. So, you know, it was a myth that people don't choose privacy. I think when given a choice, people do choose uh, to exercise their privacy rights. A lot of states have mechanisms for, for people to do that. It doesn't seem to be taken up at the rates that we expect people to take it up. Uh, what role should the states have in developing consumer education? Um, and what are, what are some best practices that you're seeing emerging in educating consumers about their rights under these new privacy laws. This is for anyone, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I could, I could start with an example that I, I heard actually um, in a different conversation with the Attorney General, which is about thinking, starting with our students. I think, you know, thinking about kids who are coming up in a, in a different world even than we did, and, and educating them on how to be a responsible digital citizen early on. I know a number of high schools are introducing courses like that. Um, I think you could probably start it even earlier. I think that's one way to do it because then often they come home and educate their parents. Um, so, so schools might be a good place to start. Um, so we think about this a lot and I don't know that I have a silver bullet answer, but I'll, I, I think a few things that make it difficult, let's say, for an AG's office to be the chief educator is we're primarily a bunch of lawyers. Um, there might be a few communications and marketing professionals in the office, but that is, um, you know, we just, at our core, don't necessarily have the skill set to communicate in mass, even if we have the information that needs to get out there. And so um, where I do think um, things could be really powerful is partnering with organizations that have pre-existing relationships with different sets of consumers, especially consumers that might be really vulnerable. So I know our office does a lot of work with the AARP around making sure that they're getting fraud alerts out um, to, you know, their base. Um, and I think there's a lot of organizations that work with a lot of different groups in Colorado, and I'm sure nationally, and, and that exist in other states. Um, I think that could also be a really interesting opportunity for us to partner with them to say, here's, let's pick three specific, easily actual elements of this law. We're not gonna explain the complexities of the interaction between you know, the First Amendment to them, but you have a right to opt out, here's how you do it. Um, you have a right to say, don't sell my data, here's how you do it. You have a right to delete your data, here's how you do it. Um, and keeping things really simple and partnering with those organizations that already have the trust and the pre-existing relationship with different consumers um, or nonprofits, you know, like, you know, um, I think that could be a really powerful way for us to potentially get the word out. Great. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? A uh, comment, 
comment, comment and a question. Uh, Scott McNeely was a founder of Sun Microsystems and has a famous quote that says, you have zero privacy, get over it. Um, I looked it up, that was back in 1990. So 34 years ago, the, the problem still exists. Uh, the question is what I heard today, we've got 19 states, there's a bit of a hodgepodge of rules and regulations. There's some common themes. And I'm thinking companies like Meta, they have like a team of lawyers you know, figure out all this stuff and see what things are changing and stuff like that. They probably have a team of lobbyists that work with you guys to draft some of the rules. But this is Silicon Flatirons. And we heard about the person down here doing AI journaling. That person doesn't have a team of lawyers. So how are startups supposed to navigate and do the right thing so they don't do something wrong and get sued or something like that? And to be clear, I'm, I'm a fan of data privacy. I'm just asking how do small companies and startups manage the current landscape? I have to say about this. <laughs> because I mean, as a practitioner, this is something that we struggle with all the time, right? Law firms are expensive, we are, we know it. And these really, really complex privacy regimes, when you're talking about 19 states, make everything exponentially more expensive. So how do we advise in a cost-effective way these smaller companies? You know, a lot of times from a practitioner standpoint, and Catherine, I'm curious whether you have experienced the same thing. The hope is that the AG's offices start with kind of the big boys, and then the smaller companies can learn from what we see in the public news, the headlines, the, you know, the, um, the DoorDash, the Sephora, the, the cases that are like, hey, this was bad, don't do this. And so the smaller companies can say, okay, I won't do that. But I mean, you know, from an AG's perspective, what is the thought when you, when I know you know that this is hard? I have a, a preliminary response, not from the AG's perspective. <laughs> Um, so first of all, that comment about privacy uh, not existing since the 1990s is cute and not accurate in the sense that we're not talking about privacy in the form of collection only, but data privacy, which is actually about a set, affording consumers a set of enabling rules and rights to be able to manage what happens to their data once it is already collected by third party companies. Um, and again, you know, the fact that it's out there and it's out there on the dark web, dark web does not make the very real harms that could be mitigated uh, less real. Um, so I just wanna disabuse that myth as a starting point. When we come to the question of like, what, did, what do we do about the small medium sized ent enterprises? This is actually already hashed out even before we get to the AG's office when we talk about scoping the laws. So in Europe, um, the law applies to uh, to companies that deal with personal data full stop, but there's some exceptions for contemplated for small and medium sized enterprises. In the United States, it's very, these laws are very specifically drafted to apply either to businesses only of a certain size um, or to apply only to businesses with a certain business model that specifically involves using large amounts of consumers' personal data. That's already there in the laws. So a lot of the startups that are sort of in this hypothetical um, would already not be covered by these laws. Um, and if you're a startup where your business model revolves around using consumers' personal data, I really, really, really hope you have a lawyer. <laughs> Back a little bit though on, they do have carve outs for small businesses, but if you're a startup, right, and you want to grow, we have these concepts of privacy by design and we want, companies want to comply. I think that's another myth that is out there. But like, you know, I think one of the other panelists said it, like we're not out there trying to, you know, steal your data and do bad things, at least for the most part, right? Unless you're um, Uber. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're trying to build privacy by design, you're trying to build systems and products that really are compliant, it still matters to understand the diverse you know, landscape of privacy. And so I don't disagree with you. And I, and I, we, we do appreciate the small business carve outs, but the reality is, is if the intention is to grow the business, we want to comply from the beginning. So I just wanna make a plug for the, this is my avoidant answer, um, <laughs> for the draft rules that were just released yesterday. These are specifically about interpretive guidance and opinion letters, at least from the Colorado Attorney General's office. Um, if you participated in the rulemaking for the Colorado Privacy Act, 
Um, I joke a lot with the team internally that like I would get off these calls and believe in democracy again because it wasn't just <laughs> lobbyists. It was individual people from Colorado, students, startups, large businesses on every single call and every single meeting that we had letting us know where, they, where their fears were, where their compliance concerns were, where they as consumers wanted to make sure their protections weren't watered down. Um, and we like truly, truly, truly took all of that to heart when drafting the regulations. And I, we're gonna do that again with the guidelines around interpretive guidance and opinion letters. But this is a tool for small businesses, for startups to get information um, and to let us know, hey, this is really clear. This is still unclear. So maybe we can put an FAQ on the page. Maybe you can issue something that isn't binding in court, but that can offer some guidance because we need to understand what is unclear. I think there's certain things that are seem very clear to us and maybe it's, we don't know that it's unclear to others. So, you know, coag.gov slash CPA. <laughs> They're out there. Take a look. Let us know what you think. And I'll, yes. just, add, I'll just add one more point. Um, and Stevie kind of touched upon this earlier. Um, most statutes, um, Virginia has a has a um, cure period. So um, what that means is that we have to reach out to a potential target and and let them know that we think that they're violating the law and they have thirty days to comply. So there's no impending lawsuit um, that they're that they're worried about. It's they have a 30 day period to fix the, fix the problem. So that, 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 that deals with, you know, allowing for, you know, people who just make honest mistakes. Um, if they can fix it, then there wouldn't be a lawsuit. Great. <clears throat> and then we have one back there. Uh, another hypothetical. If a user goes to opt out or read a disclosure, but they're visually impaired and that's not visible to their screen reader, what is the legal for the enforcers here? What is the scenario there? What does that look like uh, legally? And then for the practitioners, is this something you were telling your clients to be concerned with? Um, so it's an excellent question. I, you know, the privacy, the regulations related to the CPA actually specifically state that, you know, the rights that are given and the, and the privacy notices and all the things that are communicated to consumers have to be accessible. Um, so that was something that we heard actually in feedback during the rulemaking process, during the stakeholder process, and was incorporated into the rules. Great. Um, oh, I, we, have, we have a practitioner question, but maybe we'll fold it in the next, because I see a bunch of hands, so go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if you could comment on any of EU's experience in GDPR enforcement that may have informed your uh, rulemaking or regulatory design? I mean, I, you know, I think we definitely heard from a lot of businesses that are having to already comply with GDPR when we solicited feedback on the rules. And so I imagine that informed, <laughs> um, uh, you know, their rules. And I think, you know, practically speaking, um, you can look and see in the, in the regulations where, um, for example, where a DPIA is required and you're already performing one under GDPR, if it you know, sufficiently other meets the requirements that we have in Colorado, you can reuse that. So there were definitely considerations where we were made aware of um, or saw on our own kind of areas for overlap. So I have a question. Um, I think today I got four emails um, from Phil Weiser about 64 counties in the second term. And I know that one email that I got, um, I've never given the attorney general's office or Phil or anybody else. So I'm kind of wondering where you get all of your private information from. That's an excellent question. It is not our team, but I will take that feedback directly to the people <laughs> that deal with that. Who's got next? Yeah. Um... I, I, I find it interesting that the data protection, we're all, I guess, uh, framed as consumers um, and not human beings, but I, I, that's more of a comment. I guess I have like a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old girl, girls, I guess, and um, it seems like the social media apps are specifically, their business model is really targeting those aged kids, um, and like they're getting on as young as 11. I mean, there was like a hashtag earlier this summer, like I'm 18 or something on TikTok. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of gross, I guess. I mean, what, what are we doing to protect? I mean, it doesn't seem like anything's happening to, to uh, 
get these kids off those apps. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'll take that as a comment. Uh, no, question. I have, I have, oh, you have a, a, a response okay. to that. So to your point about the consumer framing, like, yes, completely right. Um, as we've heard from the AG's office uh, members on, um, on this panel, the general framework for, cons for attorney general's offices to be involved in this before all these data privacy laws was a consumer protection framework. It still is. It's around a relationship with a, bus a business. In Europe, the framing is a human rights framework, and there are actual human rights in the equivalent of the European Constitution um, that are they're there that say this is like this is a fundamental human right. It's not just you know your relationship with the business and the business is exploiting you, etc. Makes a huge difference in terms of the law. To the the kids question, um, I think one of the elephants in the room that we haven't actually specifically talked about are the really uh, like important AG efforts to enforce. Um, children's uh, enforce against the manipulation and exploitation of children on these platforms. Um, and so they are doing something and should get accolades for trying to do something. I have a question back then, then a question over here. Go ahead. Hey, yeah, uh, I draft a lot of privacy policies for startups, um, just piggybacking off the earlier question. Uh, so this is primarily for the AG folks, but uh, also for practitioners, just as a nerdy stylistic question. I have a lot of clients that have to comply with a bunch of state privacy laws, right? And to the extent that your regulations don't say exactly what section headers should be titled what in the privacy policy, yeah, sometimes I kind of mix them in uh, and make sure that all the information that needs to be in the privacy policy is there, but it's not, this is for Virginia residents, this is for California residents, this is for Nevada, this is for Iowa, this is for Indiana. When you read those privacy policies, do you hate that? <laughs> Personally? Or? <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's get one more question, then we can, as yeah. a panel, answer okay. both them. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one comment and a kind of long-winded question. I'm the uh, systems administrator for a Swiss company located down by Arapaho Airport and with plants also in Germany and Singapore, so I know your frustration with multinational privacy issues. Um, with the prevalence of uh, Azure, AWS, all these global cloud services, how does Colorado justify jurisdiction if they're trying to protect my data that is extra national across multiple servers and multiple deltas on backups in other nations that can be actually accessed from international waters? You're literally sitting next to our law school expert on this question. <laughs> this is the guy whose Sorry, iPad keeps dinging. <laughs> Maybe maybe if I had the question. So why, why don't we do this? So we've got two, yeah. one more. Go ahead. Question. Go ahead. Yeah. Just uh, building on the questions about addressing um, young people and particularly, um, you know, teens. So a lot of the legislative proposals in that space uh, sort of rest upon companies being able to know who is a child or what the ages of people are. Uh, and so a lot of the proposals around age verification or age assurance, uh, in many cases, take the idea that companies already know so much information, they can use that information to infer people's age. And I'm curious, how does that kind of use of personal data to gain uh, <laughs> information in order to um, take some of these child safety measures uh, run up against challenges with privacy the uh, laws that are on the books in your states okay great so we've got three questions and i'm going to let the panelists choose whichever one they wish to answer and i'll start with you andrea and we'll go down the line your memory is better than mine so i'm going to take okay. the most recent question <laughs> um you know it's interesting there's a lot of debate about what you should be using I, this is this is not necessarily like a practitioner centric answer so bear with me but um regarding what we should be using to infer information about people in order to protect those people, right? I think that's what you were getting at. There's a lot of debate about that. And companies aren't clear what they should and shouldn't be doing. And one of the main concerns they have is, you know, is this going to be discriminatory in some way, right? Are we going to make a mistake? And like the laws have some protections against that, right? You have the right to correct, you have the right to question what the algorithms are inferring about you, access your data, right? Um, 
And if you haven't done an access request to one of the major data brokers, it's very interesting. There's a lot of wrong information in there. I think I've lived in like 70 different places. Um, but we are interested to see how the regulators will come out on that with on that issue, right? And they will, they have to. That is a question that is so prominent that it requires a response. So I don't have one, but I think you will see one soon. Great. Um, quickly down the line. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll go really quick. Um, I just wanna give a plus one to the privacy policy question. I'd love to hear about that. I think it's a constant um, kind of tension in you have regulations and statutes that require disclosures to consumers to be clear and concise and understandable. And then also many pages of text telling you what needs to go in those. And so that is that is a delicate balance, I think, for anyone who practices in this space. So I just would love to hear on that. Well, um, I think we would prefer, we would prefer, you know, to have Virginia specific, but I think if, um, <laughs> I think, you know, just, you have to follow the statute and it's, you're, you're required to give policy notice, privacy notices that adhere to, that show like what are the rights under Virginia. So in terms of headers, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't give legal advice, but I think it's, it's something that's, I think, um, I mean, so long as you're just adhering to our laws and, and, and the, uh, consumers can, can can see your notices. Um, well, this is not really an answer, but I just want to say, like, if, you, if everyone kind of heard the the variety, but also depth of each of those questions, it gives you kind of an idea of what us and the colleagues that we have here deal with on a daily basis, um, and how complex the work that we do is. So, just like, thanks everyone, because <laughs> this is really hard. Um, you know, you know, and I, I second what Chandler said, I can't give legal advice on the privacy policy issue, but this is addressed in our regulations, so I would, I'd, I'd point you there. Um, uh, yeah. The only thing I'm gonna say is that if you are gonna put in headers, make sure you know <laughs> that Virginia comes second. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, th thank you, thank you everyone on the panel. Should I take one minute? Yep. Before we, yep. we thank the panel. Um, so uh, this is, by the sign of the hands that were still in the air, uh, exactly the kind of thoughtful and stimulating discussion that Silicon Flatirons takes an enormous amount of pride in hosting. With that, many thanks for spending your afternoon with Silicon Flatirons. Uh, thanks to Mahir and the panel. Please help me give them a warm thank you. Just great.